we have an exciting evening with two Harvard Business School professors who will share their thoughts on the future of work and how organizations will redefine themselves in the post-COVID world. For that, I would like to invite Ali Imran, Vice President External Engagement at Ashoka University. Ali is looking after communications and PR, placements, admissions, and outreach. Welcome, Ali, to the conference. Thank you, Priyanka. It's been an absolutely amazing day. The feast of ideas uh, that so many of our speakers and panelists have put out, uh, so many new thoughts, so much of learned wisdom. Really, it's been very stimulating. And fittingly, now we have uh, two professors who are doing some path-breaking work in the areas that we that we've discussed today. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Prithira Chaudhary. Prithira Chaudhary is the Lumbry Family Associate Professor at the Harvard Business School. He was an assistant professor at Wharton prior to joining Harvard. Prithviraj's research is focused on studying the future of work, especially the changing geography of work, a topic we've heard a lot about today. In particular, he studies the productivity effects of geographic mobility of workers, causes of geographic immobility, and productivity effects of remote work practices, such as work from anywhere and all remote. His research has been cited in BBC, Bloomberg Business Week, CNBC, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Yahoo Finance, Wired Incorporated, and India Today, India Today Television, among other outlets. Prithviraj earned his doctorate from Harvard, has a bachelor's degree in computer science from the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and an MBA from the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. Prior to academia, Prithviraj worked at McKinsey and Company, Microsoft, and IBM. Welcome, Prithviraj, to the conference. Thank you for making time for us at what is 7 a.m. Boston time. We eagerly look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Uh, can someone just confirm? Yes, we can, Prithviraj. Okay. Now, thank you uh, once again. Thanks for the opportunity to present my research. Uh, so my research is on this topic that I call work from anywhere. And I've been working on this topic for a few years now. So even prior, uh, much prior to, the, to this uh, pandemic. Uh, and so what I'm going to uh, try to do is present some findings from my research. And then I'll try to imagine what the future might look, uh, look like with remote working. So even before the pandemic, um, I, I must tell you that a large number of companies in different sectors were uh, working remotely. So some of these companies were in the fringe, small startups such as GitLab or Zapier. And these are really exciting companies that I'll, I'll talk about a lot um, in, in the talk later. But even extremely large companies like Dell had very aggressive remote work strategies. So Dell, I believe this year, touched their target of 50% workers being remote. And not only in the private sector, in, in many government organizations, especially in the US, such as parts of NASA and parts of the US Department of Agriculture, there were very aggressive remote work practices for even the past 10, 15 years. But in, in face of that, that uh, increasing trend of remote work, there was also a very active debate going on. And some of you might remember Marissa Myers from Yahoo, uh, very famously rescinding remote work policies and asking Yahoo employees to come back to the office. And it was uh, not only Yahoo. In 2017, IBM, which was actually one of the first companies that uh, did remote work and teleworking, uh, also did away with remote work pretty quietly. So, and think about this. This is 2017. Uh, IBM, the bellwether of remote work, is now sort of like uh, saying, come back to the office. And three years later, we are in this complete reversal where the whole world is now working remotely and thinking about the future of remote work. So let me define work from anywhere first. It is, it is different conceptually from working from home and, the, and work from anywhere is actually the kind of remote work that I'm uh, most familiar with, I study the most, and I'm most excited about. So in working from home, you are, you are working from your home, of, of course, but 
then in most uh, practices of working from home, you are also going to a physical office, maybe once or twice a week, or uh, you know, uh, maybe fortnightly. So the physical attachment to an office location is not given away in working from home. Now, what working from home offers uh, workers is clearly less commute. Uh, you don't have to travel every day back and forth. Uh, you have what we call temporal flexibility. You have the ability to manage your schedule much better. You might work from a more comfortable living uh, uh, space. Uh, though in India, I, I totally understand that in many cases you are sharing the, the house with other people. So it, it actually might be a problem. So it, uh, there are both pros and cons from that point of view. But that is what working from home is. You're still going to an office uh, periodically. In working from anywhere, it is actually what I would call living anywhere. So you have now the flexibility to choose which town or city or even which country uh, you can live in. And that is what I would call geographic flexibility. And once you choose that, that location, you have to rarely go back to a physical office. So maybe once a year, but it is this flexibility to pack your bags and move to a different city or town or state and, com and, and completely detach, cut the umbilical cord, if you may, with the office. What are the benefits of working from anywhere? So when I mentioned this to uh, boards uh, and the CFO uh, first gets this uh, you know, uh, real excitement because working from anywhere, you don't need people to come back to these office cubicles. And so there's immediately real estate cost savings. So the numbers I'm showing here are from the US Patent Office, which I've studied most extensively. And they experienced $38 million of real estate savings because they were located in Alexandria, Virginia. Now extrapolate this to thinking about these large technology companies located in Bangalore or, or these banking companies uh, located in Mumbai, or think about the Silicon Valley companies. And you can imagine how much real estate savings can be freed if companies allow workers to work from anywhere. In the US Patent Office, I found over and beyond the real estate savings, there were other benefits. So the first benefit was that workers moved to locations on average that was cheaper to live in. So there was cost of living reduction. And in this case, at least, the company did not cut wages. So this was more money in your pocket. And then we found really interesting patterns with respect to where people moved. So one, one pattern, for instance, was that older workers, uh, people in their 60s, moved to uh, Florida. And you can imagine why it's more sunshine. So it's almost being on retirement prior to retiring. But the thing that uh, you know, the patent office found most exciting was when we looked at productivity. And productivity has been talked about a lot in the, in the past three months. In the patent office, one advantage is you can really measure productivity very cleanly because you can see every week how many uh, patents each examiner is examining. And so we, we, we applied that measure and we actually uh, were able to separate correlational patterns with causality. And I won't bore you with the details, but as careful economists, we always have to do that. And we found that the number of patents examined went up on average by 4.4%, just by letting people live in a different location. And you may ask why. And what we found is that people, the, uh, uh, the patent examiners were exerting more effort. Uh, just by being in a preferred location, it made them more motivated, uh, exerting more effort with case uh, numbers going up 4.4%. Now, what is happening, I have to talk about what's happening in the, in the past three months, uh, is not what I would call remote working under normal circumstances. Because uh, when I looked at the patent office or other remote organizations, you did not have to deal with child uh, childcare. Uh, you were not constrained from going to a gym. You were not constrained from going to a restaurant. You were not worried about your health or the health of your family members. It has, so the past three months in this crisis has led to this worldwide and in India nationwide working from home experiment. But this is very, very different circumstances from what we would experience normally. So we looked at this and we looked at uh, the Chinese data. And in a, in, a, in a nutshell, what we found there is that workers on average were working much longer hours. 
and we're experiencing more psychic costs. And by psychic costs, essentially, uh, you know, I mean the psychological effects of, of having to deal with no life and work separation and all these additional responsibilities and concerns that you're now facing. So we measured the psychic costs using the text of what people were typing. And we coded that using machine learning analysis. And we found both psychic costs had gone up and people were working longer hours. And I think that is something I don't have to tell you, everyone is experiencing. So I actually expect the short term, uh, you know, people have told me productivity has gone up, but in many cases, productivity can go down and that is totally understandable. So really for me, what this, this whole uh, working from home, working from anywhere experiment means is what is the long term? What can we learn from these three months and apply in a more strategic way for the long-term future of work. So one of the most exciting projects I'm working on relates to that. And this is with TCS. Uh, and I was uh, fortunate to be on a panel with the TCS COO, and then we started working together. And they have announced, as you know, this company has more than 4.5 lakh employees, actually more than 5 lakh employees. And they have announced to be 75% remote by 2025, so in three years. And that has this wonderful formula that they've come up with, which is 2525. So what 2525 means is that not more than 25% of their workforce will be working in an office. And for a single worker, he or she will not spend more than 25% time working in an office. And I'm currently uh, just interviewing a cross section of TCS trying to understand how to make that transition happen because this is a very large company, not only in India, but worldwide with all these campuses. And how do you now become 75% work from anywhere in three years? But it's, it's super exciting. And what I can tell you uh, so far is they have tremendous commitment behind this project. And in a few um, uh, months or weeks, we will have more details on this. Now, people have asked me, uh, so you've talked about the benefits, the real estate savings, the productivity ben benefits, the workers moving to uh, cheaper locations. What are the costs of working from anywhere? And in one or two words, I think the costs are time zones. Because if you let people work from anywhere, then they're spreading all over the world, presumably. And then you are dealing with workers in different time zones. And then the question is, how do we organize communication? So I looked at this in a very, very large global uh, oil and gas multinational, one of the top uh, 10 fortune companies. And we, what we did is we looked at communication patterns be between time zones, between workers spread out across time zones. And to once again, causally study this, we looked at daylight savings because that, that what we call exogenously changes the time zone difference between people. And in a nutshell, what we found is that they, Patterns change. And when you have less time overlap, when you have less time overlap, then people spend less time doing synchronous communication, what we're doing right now, the video calls, the Skype calls, except for R&D workers. They do not decline synchronous workers. But IT workers, production workers, talk less on Skype and, and uh, inst instant messages if there is less time overlap between the two workers. So I think time zones is the big constraint. And one way that these companies that I call all remote companies, such as GitLab. So GitLab is a company which is now 1300 workers. Uh, from its very inception, it has been all remote, uh, which means they don't have even one single physical office. And so all their workers are spread out all over the world across different time zones including the entire C-suite. So the CEO, the COO, the CFO, everyone works remotely. And this is how GitLab has been uh, from day one. So I have a case on this now published. And the case has many sort of really interesting uh, uh, vignettes. But the one thing about how they solve the time zone problem is really interesting. So what they do is they shift the communication from synchronous, from everyone trying to be on a Zoom call, to asynchronous communication. So they use Slack uh, and they use GitLab itself, the product. And what that means is that when I'm working with someone in Tokyo, we don't have to do a call. I write up what I did throughout the day in a handbook or Slack or, or GitLab page. And then that person can wake up 
read what I've done and then totally understand what I've done and continue with his or her work. So it is that trust of saying we do not need a face-to-face -face unless it's absolutely necessary. The second thing they do is they have this organizational handbook, uh, which is a, a place where they describe all their company practices and processes in real detail, in real time. So this includes how you recruit someone, how do you send a rejection letter, and they update this every day. So this is documentation on hypersteroids. And I think this documentation on hypersteroids is really, really hard to do because as human beings, we like to do work, we don't like to do documentation. But unless you document everything in an all remote setting across time zones, it's very hard for people to know exactly all the knowledge that is in people's heads. And you cannot call people all the time. So I think this documentation and, and constructing this organizational handbook is a critical step to make communication work across time zones. The other thing that GitLab does and companies such as GitLab and Zapier is the other uh, all remote company I'm, I'm researching very closely is they organize virtual water coolers. And what I'm learning in the virtual water coolers is that it has to be uh, serendipitous. So people have to be brought together in the water cooler randomly, but someone in the organization has to organize them. So it has to be a formalized random uh, set of conversations. So in GitLab, there is actually an employee whose job is to organize these virtual water coolers. So every week that person brings together random samples of people to talk on Zoom calls, not about work, but about how the weekend was, how life is going, etc. So I think these virtual water coolers are extremely important. And the other thing that I'll say is that for in these virtual water coolers, it's very important for people to open up. So we are, as human beings, we have been primed to open up in a restaurant or, or face to face. But for senior people, it's very important to open up on camera. Uh, so, you know, the, the millennials are very comfortable sharing their lives on Instagram and they know how to do this. But for people in their 40s and 50s and 60s, we have to learn how to open up and be human on a virtual water cooler on Zoom. I think that is, that is something that is uh, very, very important in an in a all remote or majority remote company. Uh, in the last few minutes, I'm just going to imagine what the future might look. So I'll take two, three minutes and then we, we can take some questions. So the first thing I'll say for all remote and working from anywhere is, it is really an antidote to the immigration problem that we are facing worldwide. So I put up this tweet uh, from our famous president uh, and how this affects immigration from India to the US. But immigration is really tightening in many parts of the world. But if you have the company working from anywhere, then you don't need immigration. You don't need to send people to the client location. You can just work from anywhere. Uh, and then the question is, if you really extend that logic to its, to its uh, you know, logical conclusion, people are arguing, do we need these big hubs such as Silicon Valley or Bangalore? You need these expensive, congested hubs where real estate prices are out of the world and people uh, have to commute three hours every day just to get by. Do we need these hubs? And if we don't need these hubs, then two things might happen. One, you might have these north-south corridors, as I call them, uh, where knowledge work gets, gets spread out over north-south corridors, such as, uh, you know, so the... The corridor that's already very active is Silicon Valley and Vancouver. So these are geographically separated, but in the same time zone. So you can easily open an R&D center or place a knowledge worker at home in Vancouver, and that person could work easily for a San Francisco company. And there are Canadian startups, which I'm working with, which are taking advantage of the US immigration system by taking people whose visas are being rejected and and they are moving them to Vancouver, getting them a visa, and they're working from their homes for Silicon Valley companies. And these north-south corridors can start emerging. So I think for India, the question would be, you know, what corridor is Bangalore part of, or Calcutta part of, or Delhi part of? But then the other exciting thing that might happen, and this is my last slide, is that you, if the hubs start to break up, if the offices start to break up and disappear, then workers might return to smaller towns. 
And I'll just tell you about this, this exciting project I'm working on. So some of you might have been following the US news and you might have heard about Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is a town of about 1 million people in Oklahoma uh, with a very uh, bad racial past. But what they did three years back is they started this program called Tulsa Remote, where they're now attracting talent and very diverse talent, African-Americans, uh, Muslim workers, uh, single mothers, to come to Tulsa and work remotely. And if this becomes a scalable proposition, then what we will see is talent moving to middle America, or in the case of India, talent moving to smaller towns. Uh, and, and these urban hubs such as Bangalore and NCR becoming less congested. And I think that is a wonderful thing because if the, if the white collar talent moves back, there's a reverse brain drain to the small towns, then the blue collar workers will not have to go to the cities for a livelihood because we will need more schools in smaller towns. We will need more hospitals in smaller towns. So this could be a game changer in terms of, uh, you know, how we, we solve some of these inequality uh, problems between these extremely large hubs and smaller towns. So I'll stop there. Uh, and I would love to take some questions. Uh, Thank you, Prithviraj. Uh, extremely, extremely interesting session. For many of us, this is a new experience, but as you just pointed out, it's gone through a curve in many places and there are a lot of learnings. Um, some questions from the audience, which I'll go over quickly. Um, does working from home reduce productivity? How do team members stay motivated with their boss or leader working from a completely different location? This person is asking because she knows someone who is working from home and whose productivity has actually gone down. Yeah, so I guess I'll, I'll take the question more conceptually. I think uh, for working from home or working from anywhere, which is what I'm really excited about, yeah. productivity can go up if, uh, you know, so, so what can, can make productivity go down? So I think the first thing is, if there is no separation between life and work, which is what we're experiencing right now. Yeah. But this won't, this won't sustain. So as the crisis is, is behind us, we will once again have childcare. We will once again have all the support systems. Yeah. But the other more uh, you know, fundamental reason why productivity might go down is if the remote working uh, part of the organization is a small minority. If they're like 10% or 20% of the organization, and what prior research by Bhatia Weisenfeld at NYU has shown is that in that case, actually information can be hoarded in the office. So if all the senior managers are coming to the office, then everyone has an incentive to come to the office, to get information, to get resources, to just you know please the senior managers. And then the people working at home are cut off from these informational networks. And that might lead to a, a reduced productivity. Yeah. Um, the other obvious question, which more than one person has asked, is what are the downsides of working from anywhere? So I guess uh, for the worker, I don't see a very strong downside because if you are given the opportunity to work from anywhere, uh, presumably you can move to a location that you prefer more. And so when I was with a, a group of TCS employees, they're all working in Chennai. Someone said, I'm going to move to Kumbhakonam. Uh, and then I can be part of my family festivals throughout the year and not only once a year. Uh, so I think the downside is really about how to manage organizational productivity. And I feel if you have the support in terms of not only the, the IT infrastructure, which is critical, but also the organizational processes of how communication is, is conducted, how knowledge is shared. Uh, and TCS is doing a wonderful, uh, uh, I must say, uh, you know, a thing there, then productivity shouldn't go down. In, in, in fact, it can go up. Um, everyone has expressed the view that certain kinds of industries and organizations can benefit from WFA. But what about manufacturing, people who work on the shop floor, uh, there really isn't respect for them, isn't it? That is true. There'll be some professions and some tasks that you cannot, uh, you know, do in this model. But having said that, you know, I would say even there, just being forward thinking. So I'm, I'm an academic cheerleader for working from anywhere. So, I, you know, I'm very, very uh, passionate about this. I would say given the AI revolution and the revolution in virtual reality that we are experiencing, 
there'll be more manufacturing jobs that, uh, and the 3D printing revolution that we are seeing. There'll be more uh, manufacturing jobs and jobs that, you know, conceptually we are thinking of as cannot be done working from anywhere that could be done working from anywhere in a very short period of time. Um, there's a question on productivity again. Uh, are there any non-Orwellian ways of monitoring productivity? No, I think the, the Orwellian way is horrible. You know, I've been asked this question many times and I feel this policing, this, this thing just, uh, what this will do is it will really upset your best employees and they will leave immediately once they get an opportunity. Uh, so I feel really there are two, the, the two key things here. One is to define productivity based on output, not on input. It doesn't matter how many hours I stare at my computer. Uh, it, is, it, it is all about my output matrix and just having it very clear in the document or in the contract, what is that uh, productivity measure? But the second thing is just, give, just letting go, just having trust. In the last panel, someone was talking about trust. And I think managers really, really have to trust people if their subordinates are sitting across five time zones. You cannot monitor people across five, five time zones. Uh, there's a question on the kind of the opposite of Tulsa, which is that there was a wave of co-living and co-working facilities in places like Bali, where people stayed for several months and or even years and worked from there and also enjoyed the new locations. Yeah. This, to, this was a very desirable concept, but do you see a future for this? There is a very exciting phenomena that I was tracking prior to COVID. So this is with the millennials and the young people, and uh, they call themselves digital nomads. So what they do is they work for Google or work for Facebook, but there was a company called Remote Year that I was working with. So what Remote Year did was planned their entire year where they would spend three months in London, three months in Sweden, three months in Indonesia, but work for Google. And for these uh, millennial kids, I think I shouldn't call them kids anymore. Uh, for these millennials, uh, the main in incentive was not to buy an expensive house or a car. They don't care about these things. It's about life experiences. So they don't think about life as having 51 weeks of work and one week of vacation. They really think about life, about collecting experiences along the way. Uh, and I think working from anywhere could be a great thing for the, for the young part of, of your workforce. Yeah. I think many people would like to know the contact details of that company, Prithviraj. Um, do you see a Tulsa kind of scenario in India breaking open the narrative that we need cluster development and that taking people to jobs is the way out and not taking jobs to people. I, I, I think you said it beautifully, Ali. That's exactly what I think. And I feel, so the reason Tulsa happened was there was a foundation, uh, the, Kai, the George Kaiser Foundation. George Kaiser is an alumnus of HBS. Uh, and so he saw Tulsa and he really wanted to make a difference to the society in Tulsa. So he started this remote program three years back. So I feel there's a great opportunity of someone starting a similar experiment in Nagpur or you know, Shiliguri or any small town and really uh, attracting people to come there, building. So actually in Tulsa, one thing I'll say is that the, the workers who've moved to Tulsa and working from Tulsa, they're not working from home. They're all working from this co-working space, at least prior to COVID, called 36 degrees north. So you need to build a little bit of infrastructure you need to really energize this. But I think this can be a wonderful thing for India. And the last question really, Prithviraj, because we are out of time here, uh, born out of enlightened self-interest, I think. What are the skills which could be deficient in the US and therefore would make Indian workers attractive to US corporations? Not counting BPO and KPO, which are already established. No, I think, uh, you know, this is a... Uh, very profound question. And I feel, uh, you know, I think of, of human capital in India as, as our greatest resource, and this cuts across everything, right? So the one thing, so, uh, you know, this talk is being, uh, uh, in, it's in the context of Ashoka University. And I feel our skills in humanities really, really is under leveraged uh, in, in fields such as sociology and political science and arts and designing. And I feel today with working from anywhere, it's not only the engineering and the technology uh, fields that can be done from anywhere. It is also the, the social science fields and the humanities fields. So I would, you know, I was with, a, as you, uh, you know, Ali, I was with a group of teachers and principals, and I was urging them to think about saying India is some of the world's greatest teachers. Why don't we try to now teach the world instead of just teaching our classroom? So I feel 
you know, the only bound is our imagination. We should really rethink about the opportunity that presents us as knowledge workers. Thank you, Prithviraj. That was just an absolutely marvelous session. You packed in so much in half an hour. Sorry to have pulled you out so early, but Not I think no it was worth every moment. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, goodbye. We'll see you soon again. Absolutely.